this space is yours. Thank you. Uh, would you need you something? I think I'm good. Okay. Hey everyone, Bella Taji. Uh, my name is Corey Lassall, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about creativity. It's something that I've been, that has been a thread throughout my life for the last 10 years, uh, 12 years really, and I'd like to share some of that with you today. So I know what a lot of you might be thinking right now. I'm not creative in the slightest. I never can be. I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe I don't even care. Um, and I definitely thought that myself for a really long time. But if you think about software engineering, um, what we do in our day-to-day, -day, it isn't just copy-paste either from a book or from Stack Overflow. We actually have to use creative ways to combine uh, the different things that we need to use in our tool set, basically, to create the software that we do. We take a really large business problem, we break that down into smaller parts, and then we figure out different ways to combine that to make the thing that we're actually building for our users. So if you look at the definition of creativity, um, it's really just a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's using the information that we already have and using new information through research or whatever to combine and use that in a different way. I mean, that doesn't sound like a scary definition to me, so hopefully this feels a little bit more uh, approachable. But uh, basically, if you look at it, it also sounds a lot, to me at least, like innovation. And the idea behind innovation is that we're creating new things, right? Well, same thing with creativity. Um, but we almost view creativity as a dirty word, but we throw around innovation all the time in tech circles. And one of the things that I think that also puts us off is we view it as something you're born with or you're not. It's a binary. You're either creative or you're an artist type or you're not. And that's just not true. It actually is a skill, uh, and you can learn how to hone that skill if you decide to and continue to work on a particular thing. And we'll talk about different types of creativity that you can try later on. Um, but where I learned this from is a book called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, and I super highly suggest this book if you haven't read it. Um, but basically, it's the idea of your left brain is kind of a jerk and thinks you aren't creative and your right brain is totally creative, and it's telling your left brain how to shut up and how to get into your right brain and stay there. And she kind of breaks it down for drawing specifically, but, you know, she teaches you five smaller skills, like how to draw lines or how to focus on negative space. And then that ends up being able you being able to draw actual things from that, but you are learning these smaller skills and you build them. And then over time, you get a lot faster at it and it gets a lot easier for you to be able to use those new skills. And the reason why this works is this uh, really long word here, neuroplasticity. Um, so basically, this is the study of how adaptable your brain is. And it turns out it's really adaptable. And they've been studying it for a long time, but in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of breakthroughs here. But how this relates to the talk is basically you are able to learn things if you decide that you want to. These are skills that you can learn, and the more you do it, um, the more neural pathways are built in your brain that make it even easier for you to be able to do it again in the future. So if you think about when you're doing a new architecture pattern in your application, for example, the first time you use it, it's really hard. You don't know exactly where things should go. It takes you a lot longer to be able to implement that. But over time, you get to a point where it's just super easy, and it makes a ton of sense. And you just know this goes here, that goes there, and it just becomes kind of second nature to you because you've practiced that skill. And another thing is that creativity isn't quite the same thing as art. So art is usually a physical work. Uh, a manifestation of creativity in the physical world usually. So there is creativity that goes into making art, but creativity is a separate thing from art. You can be creative in the way that you live your life. You can be creative in the way that you make your software. There's a lot of different components here. And basically at its core, it is a mindset as I mentioned. But if you look at the definition of art, I think this is what really trips us up because it seems really scary. If you look at all the words here that I've highlighted, those are the ones that usually people are like, well, I can't make visual things. I don't make beautiful things. I don't know how my software fits into this. And maybe it doesn't. Um, I like to make my software pretty, and I'll talk about that later. But, you know, that's fine if you're just purely functional, no problem. Um, but the idea here is that um, there's a lot of words that we associate with art that we don't usually associate with a technical um, you know, view of ourselves as technical people. But this definition of art is a lot closer to what we actually do in our day-to-day. -day. We have skills, and we practice them over and over again, and we get better at stuff. 
Um, so there's a little bit of art and creativity when we are creating our software, in addition to all the technical, boring stuff, too, that powers it. Cool. So um, we've covered how creativity is actually a skill. It's something you can learn and practice. And also talking about what it is and isn't. So now we want to talk about why. So you're probably asking yourself, why do I care? Why do I want to make space in my very busy life to be able to practice creativity? Um, and I'm hoping to persuade you with some of the reasons why I found both through science and my own life, which really made uh, creativity a valuable part of my life. So one of the first things is flow. Have you ever just kind of zoned out while you're programming and it's four hours later? You forgot to eat lunch. You look at the clock and you're like, oh my gosh, I got to go home. Uh, that, that was flow. So you got into basically the right-hand side of your brain and you were there and you stayed there and you continued to create and you saw the whole. Um, and if you think about programming, what we're usually doing is putting a lot of stuff in our head as we're working through a problem. So we're thinking about uh, how we might want to re-architecture a certain piece. We're thinking about what patterns we might want to do. Um, we're putting all the business things in there, to-dos that we want to litter throughout the code. So a lot of our programming work is in our mind. And flow is really easily to easy to interrupt. So if somebody taps you on the shoulder or the PM wants to talk to you about something, um, that'll come, make that all come crashing down. Uh, but the good news is uh, you can get into flow. The more you practice creativity, it really helps you access that side of your brain and kind of put, um, quiet out the noise and get there much easier. So that's something that can improve over time as well. So this one's a little harder to quantify because when you are a more creative person, you practice it more in your life, you just tend to have a lot more ideas. Um, and it's basically it kind of permeates every part of your life. So I think I'd, uh, I have this long trip I'm on right now. Like I was creatively putting it together. How would I make this whole thing work? Um, I feel like I'm a little bit more creative in um, software. And of course, I do some art stuff that I'll talk about later. Um, but basically, it gives you the ability to look at problems in a different way and spot patterns that other people aren't going to see because they don't have the same sort of practice that you've been working on. And that really helps you to frame problems and also get out of some of the assumptions that you might have made about problems before. So if you're like, well, I have to do X, Y, and Z for this problem, if you can think about it creatively, you might be able to take down those barriers and think of a different way to solve it. And the idea behind learning transfer, this is kind of one of those sciencey ones, but uh, the idea is you learn something in one context and that can be applied somewhere else. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing. It's not like you learn this one skill and you use it over and over and over again. Um, but if you learn something and it's in a similar context, it might just automatically transfer. Your brain will be like, oh, that's the same thing, just subcon uh, subconsciously, and it kind of just does it. But there are other times where you can take learnings from something and then use it somewhere wildly different. So for example, <clears throat> one of my favorite examples of this is Steve Jobs um, took a calligraphy class in college. So he was really enamored with calligraphy and he really got into fonts after that. And that's just something that continued to permeate everything he made from then on, including Macintoshes and iPhones and things like that. So just the one small act of practicing calligraphy changed the course of computing history. Another cool thing about creativity is you get to express yourself, and everybody's totally different. If you give two people the same problem, they're going to have a different solution at the end of it. Even if they work on the same code base, even if they have the same spec, they're not going to write the exact same code. That's because we bring our own personality to it, our own skills, our own bias, our own creativity. So there's always going to be a different um, output depending on who's going to create it. And what's really cool is that you get to engage different sides of yourself. So if you've just been, you know, a technologist that works like 10 hours a day and that's pretty much all you do, um, that's fine. I mean, you live your life how you want, but I like to have things outside of work. So I find that I find a lot more balance when I am practicing things like creativity or going out in the nature and things like that uh, because I get a little bit burnout in the software uh, business because you have to make all these concessions to get things out the door. 
Um, you might have to not do as nice architecture pattern that you wanted to because you need to ship it next week instead of three weeks. So um, it's really nice whenever you get to work on something and make technology not your only creative outlet. It gives you another way to think um, outside of work. And this is something that I found pretty surprising from learning how to be creative. Um, I'm a lot more grateful for things that I run into in life because I'm starting to notice a lot more. Uh, I'll talk about photography a bit later, but um, basically I've been taking photography classes off and on for like 10 years. So now when I'm walking around, I find little flowers or little pieces of graffiti or something like that that are really pretty. Um, and I just notice a lot more beauty in the world around me that um, I Somehow, in the past, I just overlooked it, or how the shadow falls through a tree or something like that. Um, but you'll notice that your mind gets opened up to these sorts of things, and you're like, oh, the world's kind of cool, actually. So um, that was something that I did not expect whatsoever out of creativity years ago when I started doing this. Um, but in addition to that, you know, being in flow and being in the moment is um, nice as well. And then finally, it's fun. I don't know uh, how much, how many people have played with different stuff. Who has a creative outlet outside of work right now? Does anyone? Can you raise your hands if you do? Like that includes music and dance and drawing and painting and photography. Oh, not a lot of you. Okay, so hopefully I'm convincing you that you should try some of this stuff. And I will give you some um, tips later on different things you can try. Um, but the idea is it's super fun. Um, so basically... You get lost in your own world, that whole flow thing, and you're able to just have joy in the moment of the things that you are creating right then. And um, sometimes you'll get, like, it depends if you are comfortable with the idea of sharing and getting feedback and stuff, but I like to share as well, and then I get a lot of positive reinforcement from that as well, so I continue to keep sharing, and I continue to keep creating. I also get bored super easily, um, so... Basically, I took zero classes in art in middle school, high school, nothing. Basically, I took some as an adult. I think 25 is the first time I took some sort of creative class. So there's tons of things I never learned that people have been studying forever. So it's basically an infinite space where I can continue to learn all sorts of new things. So I postulate that we're functional artists. So. Um, I'm going to talk about how I view technology through a creative lens in the next section here um, and hopefully open your mind a little bit to the fact that you are actually already being creative even though you're not necessarily doing some sort of art form in addition to that. So we're going to do an exercise. Please bear with me. Okay, so everybody, close your eyes. That way nobody will judge you. Nobody can see you. You're going to be thinking about something. And take a deep breath. Let it out. Okay. So what we're going to do is take the product you work on right now and think about something that you would want to add to it or an architecture pattern that you might want to change or introduce. And just think in depth about what that would look like, uh, how people would use it, what that's going to do to your code base. Cool. I'm not going to give you forever, unfortunately, but um, I hopefully you were able to come up with at least one thing that you might want to do in your product right now. And if you didn't, if I gave you five minutes alone in a quiet room, you would probably come up with two or three ideas of things you might want to try. That is creativity. That is taking what you have right now, which is the baseline, and figuring out what you can add to it. So, yay, everybody was just creative. Thank you for uh, going along on that ride with me. So if you think about the scientific method, the way that we break down problems to understand them in science is we take a huge system we don't quite understand, we break it into smaller parts, and then we try and reason about the smaller parts, and then we kind of put them back together, and then we try to figure out stuff about the whole. So that's how we do science. In art, it's similar. You take a sunset, and then you figure out, okay, how can I break that out and show it in art? So a lot of times it'll just be like a line with a half circle. So yay, now you have a sunset. Maybe add some color there. Um, but basically, you are taking something huge, trying to break it down, and figure out how to model that. And we do that a lot in software as well, obviously, with our business uh, solutions that we're trying to build with the stuff that we create. So we take these smaller problems, we create abstractions like architecture, things like that, and functions, objects, how, and figure out how we want to put those together. 
So then we create abstractions to try and model the thing that we are trying to build. And then after that, we put everything back together. Now, uh, Gestalt, the concept here, is that basically the sum is much greater than its parts. So if you think about a building, you don't usually look at each individual brick that is going into that building. But all those things did make up that uh, building like that. And then there was all the plumbing and a bunch of other stuff that went into making that particular building. But you kind of view it as a whole. It's like, oh, there's a building. The same thing with software. You might, at the moment that you're building it, think about the function or the module, the object that you're working on. But at the end, it kind of becomes this emergent system that is a sum of its parts, but much greater than that. It's not just these five functions. Now it's a feature that people know and love. Another thing we have to deal with a lot is constraints, what the app needs to do, what it doesn't need to do, what it should look like, a lot of different things like that. Uh, this can really um, spur our creativity. So um, if you put constraints on yourself, it, if your options are limited, basically, it's a lot easier to be creative because you have fewer options. So for me, I kind of complicate that because I like everything and I buy everything and I've got thousands of dollars worth of markers. Um, so I had a really tough time actually choosing which markers to bring with me on this trip. Um, I brought most of them, <laughs> but um, basically if I had brought five, just the grays, so I can do, you know, a representation of the shadows or something of the things I see, um, then I would be a lot more creative in what I choose as my thing that I'm going to be drawing or um, how I'm going to use the colors I have to be able to um, represent that thing. And I like to write software that is readable and it's kind of like a paragraph and there's flows. And um, I don't know what yours usually looks like, but I really like to break it up so that it's more readable and modular and that when I'm looking at a function, I can understand exactly what's happening. And it's not just the what am I doing right now, it's also the why am I doing that and giving context to the things that's going to happen in your program. This is the only lines of code in the entire uh, presentation. Um, but basically, when you write software that people can read, then it's easier to maintain and it's better for everybody and yourself in the future as well. And then finally, if we talk about the agile process just in general at a high abstract level, um, it mirrors pretty closely what the creative process looks like as well. So when you're doing um, a painting, for example, you might go to, let's say we're going to do a lake. You go to the lake like 10 times, take different random pictures at different times of the day, figure out what the best composition is. You might do some thumbnail sketches of what you're going to build and put it together in different ways. And you come up with something that you want to build at the end of it. And then when you start actually building that masterwork, then you still write pencil on the uh, canvas, and then you might build it up with a bunch of layers of oil paint on top of that. So you're doing this iterative thing, which is what Agile is at its core. Well, nobody does Agile right, but <laughs> that's a different topic. Um, so if you think about Agile software engineering, so we are building something, we're getting feedback, giving it to the users, then we incorporate that again, and it's just the same cycle where we do something where we break it down, we understand, we research, we do more, we get feedback, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so they are pretty similar to each other. Cool, so that's how software is kind of a little more creative than you might have been thinking about it in the past. Um, and hopefully that'll help you start to see yourself a little bit more creative than you have in the past as well. Um, so my story, I've alluded to it a little bit, but the way I started out with creativity is I happened to pick up the Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain book, I don't know, when I was 25, so it was a while ago. And um, basically I kind of experimented for a year and a half with it where I was um, doing watercolor and oil because I just go to the art store and I buy whatever I can find that I haven't played with before. So I was trying all these different things. I bought a bunch of books on how to draw specific things. But what was really cool about drawing on the right side of the brain is it teaches you how to see, not how to draw. So it teaches you how to see the negative spaces and draw those, or draw the lines of something, instead of here, draw a house, and here are the five steps how to draw the house. Um, so I used that book, and then eventually I kind of abandoned it, because drawing wasn't really something that I thought was uh, something I was super interested in. So I picked up um, the camera and I did camera stuff for like 10 years or so. Um, took a bunch of classes in that. 
But there was a lot of lessons that I've already talked about here that stuck with me from that Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain book, which was the idea of this is a skill that you can build. It's not, you know, fixed, and you are an artist if you want to be. You just practice it. An artist is someone who practices it, essentially. Um, so I kept thinking about that, and it really did kind of help me with how I approached my photography as well. And I don't know if you follow me on Twitter or not, but one of the things that I do a lot on Twitter is I do sketch noting. So I uh, found it, I guess, in a few years ago, like two and a half years ago, I saw somebody else sketch noting at a conference. It was like, oh, I want to do that. So my first sketch note was some stick figures <laughs> and some words. And that's where I started a while ago. But then it just kind of got um, more in depth over time from that. And then I went back to drawing on the right side of the brain. And I went back and found other books that taught me how to draw other things. So it really got me back into it. So I've been drawing a lot, actually, for the last two and a half years. But there's good news and there's bad news here. Um, if you want to be a creative technologist, you're going to have to practice. And this is going to be hard because you need to make space in your life for it. And if you think about, let's say you want to learn Kotlin. So if you start learning Kotlin and you do it once every three months, how good are you going to get at Kotlin? Not very good if you do it so slow over time. But if you decide that you are instead going to do it really often, then you will get better at Kotlin if you work on it daily, for example, in the applications that you're building. Um, so if you think about it, that's just, that's the building the neural pathways that you are um, doing through the practice. So daily's best. That's probably not going to happen. That doesn't happen for me. Um, what I do is I try to shoot for three times a week. So I've actually reorganized my life around being more creative because that's something I want to continue to build. So I wake up at 6 a.m., which is not my favorite hour of the day at all. I am not a morning person. I go and exercise about two miles, and I wake up. And then I come home, and then I do some creative stuff, and then eventually I get ready and go to work. So I've made it so that my mornings are creative and exercise and self-care, and then I go to work, and, you know, they can have the rest of me. And then I get home, and I'm t just as tired as I was before, but now I actually got to do things that I care about in addition to working on stuff for the business. So it's been really nice for me to be able to set up my life in that way. Um, but that might not be the solution for you. Just experiment and see where it makes sense. Maybe you just go to a coffee shop and sketch for like three hours on the weekend. That's cool too. So once you've decided that you want to try and build this creativity skill, there's all sorts of different types of mediums that you can choose. You could do dance. You could do music. You could go to a creative writing class. Um, I've chosen sketch noting and... Uh, photography for the most part, but there's other things I've played with as well, and I really think I want to take a writing class because not only do I think it'll help with my public speaking, like making a story out of what I'm telling people, but I took a class last year um, making your own comic book, and it turns out most of that's writing, and I just can't write at all. Like, I can draw some of this stuff, but you really need a story behind your comic book. So that's probably my next endeavor. So I talked a little bit about sketchnoting here and there, but if you look at this, it's actually a sketchnote I did in preparation for this talk. So on the left-hand side, you see drawing on the right side of the brain, notes from that. And on the right side, I have a bunch of notes from uh, some of the TED Talks that I was watching. But the idea is you take, um, like if you're in a talk like this one, for example, you might take what I'm saying and do big bullet points on my big topics and maybe do small little bullet points underneath that. So it's kind of like using H1 tags and stuff, but on your paper. So it's just highlighting what's more important and helping other people kind of visually navigate your notes. Because if you look at the normal note set, it's just a bunch of lines across the page, and that's not super useful most of the time. You don't usually go back and look at those. It might help you remember, but it's not something that's visually interesting that you actually want to go and revisit. Um, with this sketch note, um, it's just a lot easier to read and kind of take the main topics away from it. And then I also find that I retain a lot more of the information whenever I'm doing sketch noting. Um, studies have shown that 29%, you're 29% more likely to remember the stuff that you have written down um, if you do it in a visual format because you are combining a d ton of different ways that you are learning all at once. And that really helps you to solidify that understanding. So if you want to get started with sketch noting, then I know it looks like really overwhelming. I'm going to go back to sketch noting. Um, but there's a book called Sketchnoting, uh, the Sketchnote Handbook, 
that is really easy and breaks it down into all the different things. Basically, you start by writing your letters and going over it twice. So now your letters are twice as bold. So that's step one. And then maybe you'll throw in some small icons and stuff, but you don't actually have to do that. You can just go with text for a long time. And if you want to try this particular conference, I would highly suggest doing that, because if you sit, post it on Twitter, people really love it, even if they're like rudimentary sketch notes. Um, I would highly suggest at least trying it out. You don't have to share. Nobody's going to judge you. They might be interested, and they might stare at what you're doing. Um, but it's, it's fun, and it's a fun way to meet people as well. But enough about sketch noting. Um, so part of the problem when you start practicing you're going to find that your inner critic is going to try and derail you. Not only are they going to say, oh, I've got to do this, and I've got to call the doctor, and I've got to do that, and you won't ever make the time for being creative. In addition to that, when you actually sit down and you're trying to draw on a white piece of paper, um, your left brain will try to do the visual shorthand you've done before, so stick figures or whatever. Um, you have to be able to make that inner critic shut up. And if you have read Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain or Pick It Up Later, she's got a lot of different exercises in there that really help you with that. But one of my favorites was when you were learning how to draw lines and contours, is turning the photo upside down or the thing that you're trying to draw. And your left brain is trying to uh, name all the different pieces. And it's like, that's a hand. No, what, what are you doing? I don't know what's going on. And then eventually the left brain just drops out completely and then lets your right brain take over. And then you're just kind of creating. And if you talk, if you think about um, what you're drawing, you're going to say, you know, hard, strong, soft, or whatever, instead of, I am drawing a line, and this is a hand. So it's really interesting whenever you make that inner critic shut up, and you can actually be able to create. Sweet. Oh, oh yes, another point I wanted to make there. So one of the things that I like to do is when I'm feeling stuck on a problem that I don't really want to do, like write a talk, for example, what I'll do is trick myself by doing something creative. So with this particular talk, I wrote up four sketch notes on different ideas that I might want to explore and what I might want to put on there, sent them around to people and got feedback and stuff. And I still didn't want to write the talk. So then I did more sketch notes um, on a lot of TED videos and some other things that I could bring into it. So I just kind of continually found new things to keep me going on the path of writing this talk, even though I was scared and didn't want to do it at all. I kind of do the same thing as well when I'm building software. If I'm really confused by the flow or how it's interacting with the cloud or whatever, then I might draw a diagram that'll help me understand what exactly is going on in code right then. I call it drawing pretty pictures, basically. I go to the whiteboard and I draw something up instead of trying to focus and bang my head against the desk. So what's really cool is we live in a great time. The internet has all sorts of inspiration for you. Um, there's a lot of free things that you can do. There's free videos, there's free podcasts. Um, there's a lot of tutorials as well. Um, I also personally really like to take classes because not only are you learning a new skill from a skilled teacher, you're also meeting other people who are interesting and not inside technology. I don't know about you, but my network in general is mostly filled with technologists, and I'm trying to um, get more people in that, um, in that circle. So it's really helpful for that as well. Uh, one of my favorite classes, I took it this year actually, it was called Drawing Games. And I thought that it was going to be, you know, she was going to do games and we're going to draw things. But basically what it was was how to get inspiration. And we did do some things where she said, okay, well, draw a square and draw a line and erase half of it and do this and do that. And everybody in the class did that. Everybody came up with a completely different painting at the end of it. Um, so that was cool. That was one of the things we did. We also went on like a collection walk where you go and pick up things that are interesting or draw pictures of what you're seeing. Um, so it was a really cool way to kind of look at new ways to get inspiration because we can find something all around us that is inspiring to us if we're looking for it, though. So someone had suggested this to me fairly early in my sketch noting career anyway. Um, uh, I was putting it up on Twitter and it was starting to get buried, the different drawings I was creating, basically. So I ended up creating like a Tumblr where I put all these things in one place. So now I have basically a record of the last two and a half years of drawing. By the way, Tumblr is not the best place to do that. I would suggest something like uh, Pinterest or something instead, because it's a little bit easier to view all of them. And now I have an if that is putting all of my tumbles into the, the Pinterest. But anyway, I digress. Uh, the idea is you are creating out loud, 
and you are putting your work out there. So when I was talking about sketchnoting earlier, when you sketchnote, you use pen. So you can't erase and you can't change things. You just commit to the thing that you created right then. And then you ship it at the end of it. So it's like an MVP, just get it out the door. So you spend an hour in the talk, you wrote it in pen, it looks at, like it does, and then you ship it, and then you're done. And then um, what's really cool is you get a lot of feedback, usually positive feedback. Some people are jerks, ignore them. Um, just keep, keep creating and keep sharing. And it's really fun because you find new people that you can interact with. So I found a lot of new friends through sketchnoting and Twitter, which has been really cool. And then I meet with them at conferences and stuff. And if you're a sketchnoter, let me know. But basically, it all boils down to experimenting. Um, I've mostly talked about the physical arts because those are the ones I'm interested in for the most part. But if you're interested in dance, you might try any dance moves or whatever. Um, but I go to art stores and I just buy random things that I don't know how to use or that I've never seen before and then combine them in new ways. And that's pretty fun um, to be able to experiment. And um, one of the things to keep in mind is even though it's telling you in the last slide to create out loud and kind of get some positive feedback to help you keep going. You don't have to share everything if you don't want to. It doesn't have to be a masterpiece. It's just there for you doing it. The sake of doing creativity for the sake of being creative is definitely a valid thing too. So I would highly suggest doing that. Cool. So I'm going to sum up here, but basically creativity is not just for artists. It's a skill that you can learn. And there's a lot of benefits in your life. So that is the TLDR of this talk. Um, but to review the practical benefits. So if you um, are creative or more creative in your life, then you're going to be able to find more creative solutions to problems that you encounter. Or you'll start to see patterns and things that other people overlook or just don't see, which has been um, pretty valuable to my life. You also, I didn't talk about this too much, but you learn a visual language so you can talk to designers and product managers um, in a way that they can understand a little bit better than hand waving and words or code. So if you are able to draw wireframes of what you think this feature should do, then you're speaking their language. It's something that they can understand. In addition on the making me a better human side of the house, um, I am able to see more beauty around me and I'm happier and I get more gratitude and stuff. Um, but also, I think what also really feeds into this happiness is letting go of the inner perfectionist and silencing that critic. I don't know about yours, but mine is extremely loud. Uh, she will not shut up most of the time, <laughs> but I've learned ways to silence her a little more. And then finally, you get to enjoy the flow and just be there in the moment. Cool. So I hope that I've convinced you to at least try and play around maybe with sketch noting or with something else. Um, and I can't wait to see what you create. Uh, obrigada. Thank you, Carly.